Step outside. Yat A, Anoltro, welcome. Hello, everyone in the beauty way. Welcome to Indigenous Ways Wisdom Circle this Wednesday evening. Uh, we are so grateful to have all of you with us this evening and those in the future that are going to be watching this archived show, Seven Generations and More into the Future. Thank you for being with us. We'd like to take this time to acknowledge the traditional owners and ancestors of the lands each one of us resides on. Here in particular, Elena and I are sitting atop the Oka Poke Owinge, also known as Santa Fe. Thank you all, uh, ancestors and all, for blessing us this evening. Tonight, we are so excited because we have been waiting for this night. Uh, Penny Gamble Williams is an environmental human rights arts activist. She was born in Providence, Rhode Island. She is an enrolled member of the Chappaquiddick tribe of the Wampanoag Nation, uh, an historical non-federally recognized Massachusetts tribe, and we do want to talk about that a little bit. She is also the spiritual leader for her tribe and is president of the Chappaquiddick Tribes Nonprofit Corporation. Please welcome Penny Gamble Williams. Thank Hello. you so much for being hey, Tell us a little bit about yourself. Let's get started with this show and some of the salient events that have uh, impacted your walk from childhood to now. Thank you. Boy, that's a long journey. <laughs> Oh, but it's a good one. I, I want to say kwe kwe akoni, greetings. Um, it's really great to be here. And speaking of my journey, uh, it started in Providence, Rhode Island. Um, my parents, my mother was a visual artist and my father a jazz trumpet player. And uh, so I grew up around a lot of music and visual arts and crafts and so forth. And Providence is a very interesting place because a lot of different people migrated there. And so when I was growing up, I went to school with people from who were Armenian, um, Portuguese, Cape Verdean, Italian. I mean, it was just um, an interesting journey. Um, with you know, just being around so many different people. And of course, this, the area where I grew up, which the east side of Providence, we had uh, Narragansett, we had um, other Wampanoags, and um, actually somebody from the Penobscot nation who was living in the neighborhood. So um, there was always something interesting happening, uh, needless to say. and. In terms of art and culture and um, learning about other people, um, it, it left quite an impression on me. And within my own house, um, my mother would always talk about the Wampanoag and being Chappaquiddick and um, what that meant to her. And she learned so many things from her father, my grandfather. And I never got to meet my grandfather, but I knew him spiritually because my mother and grandfather talked about him a lot. And so did a lot of the elders. And uh, it was very comforting for me uh, to learn about him. He was known as being quite a character in, in the neighborhood. He was um, um, a letter carrier, that's what they called him, a postman. And he had quite a root and everybody knew him. So, you know, I would always hear something, a little tidbit about my grandfather, how he loved dogs. And, you know, my grandmother would always have to contend with stray dogs coming to the house and um, how he, you know, loved to dance. And he was always at um, the different powwows and August meeting in uh, the Narragansett's gathering that they have in August and so many things uh, he knew how to make things and 
so this always, um, I don't know, it gave me a lot of energy to just sit around and listen to people talk about him. And it was kind of this mystical, you know, character in, in my life. And as I got older, um, I really didn't pay that much attention to being Chappaquiddick Wampanoag. I was with my um, elder relatives. They lived in New Bedford and uh, they <clears throat> always talked about, you know, how life was and what was going on in the neighborhood. So, and I was always around adults, always around elders. I was the only child. So whenever, you know, my parents and my grandmother especially um, wanted to um, visit the relatives, we just either get on a bus or my dad would say, you know, let's just go to New Bedford. We were there all the time. That's where my grandmother was born. And as I became an adult, um, I, you know, I went to school, I had been married, I had a child, and I felt like I needed to explore other areas. Um, you know, I was, I was an artist and I had done some, you know, art um, events in Providence and in Massachusetts, but I just wanted to go someplace else. So I ended up in DC for a visit and ended up staying. And I arrived during the time of the Trail of Broken Treaties. And that really opened those channels of going beyond just being Chappaquiddick and you know, knowing about what was happening in Rhode Island and Massachusetts. I mean, this was it's Turtle Island, this was everywhere. And uh, so I was very interested, but I didn't really do anything until 1978 when the uh, longest walk happened. And I, I walked from where I lived in Maryland to DC. And that was the beginning of me wanting to get involved and just kind of being a person behind the scenes if it, whatever people needed a ride or a flyer being an artist i was always asked to to do a flyer and i ended up working at the longest walk office um, as they were closing things down so that challenged me and that's when i became very interested also in my own uh, tribal community but the environment, everything that was happening, everything that was happening, um, it just opened my eyes. That is so what I would call rich in an indigenous sense. Um, the access to the stories, the oral stories and traditions handed down from your grandfather um, obviously, we're influenced by his grandfather and his grandparents and on and on. So what comes to my mind to ask you is, when did the Wampanoags first experience colonization? What year was the first contact? Oh, well, I'm sure around the time of um, John Smith exploring the coast, mm -hmm. um, you know, our people always knew what was going on. Um, and uh, there were um, interactions um, on Martha's Vineyard in particular, or Note Bay, as we call it, mm -hmm. and TP Coordinate. <clears throat> so our people had encounters during that time, and then there wasn't really a lot of trust. That's the story that's been handed down because of some of the things that happened. And then later on, uh, in the early 1600s, some of our men were kind of lured onto the ships because there was trading and you know um, interesting things from another part of the world and so the trading that happened and sometimes our our men were captured and ended up ha having to go wherever that ship was going and um so there are stories about Ipanau and and different people who ended up um in in england so uh mm -hmm. 1620, around that time, uh, the uh, people from England ended up at Patuxet, which is really, uh, you know, that was one particular village and people had already um, 
I guess the diseases just decimated our community. And for us on the island, um, it wasn't until the 1640s that people started coming and asking us or trying to figure out who we are and what we were all about. And of course, the, the island itself is, is beautiful, a very lush island, you know, with wetlands and um, just uh, ponds and it's just beautiful. And that was the beginning of the end in a sense for us. Um, uh, Chappaquiddick was very easy to get to um, from the main island. And it was a little different for us as opposed to the Aquina because they were on the Western part of um, Martha's Vineyard Island. And it was harder for um, the English and, and the new people to get there, although they did get there at some point. But for us, it, it, it happened a lot earlier. Um, I didn't get that. Could you try again? Do I need to say something again? No, I don't know what that was. Uh, okay. I so, couldn't say. Did somebody turn? Elena, what's going on? Oh, I think that might be someone's phone, but just keep going. Or a, like okay. a Siri. Siri, maybe. Okay. Um, so, you know, there were so many things that happened to us. And we were trying desperately to hold on to our land, to um, hold on to our culture. Um, at some point, uh, the missionaries came and, you know, there was a lot of um, conversion uh, going on at different, different times and different levels of being um, coerced. Although it is said that our people love stories. And even though um, we didn't know English, it was the way that the um, ministers would tell the stories and, and you know, the, the Bible stories. And, and we would sit, our people would sit and listen. And so they were, I don't know, it was very, it was very difficult. Some, some of the... Um, stories um, are, are heartbreaking because um, it divided families. And as time went on, those who converted to Christianity were um, separated from families, members who did not wish to convert. And at that point, um, our people were told not to listen to our sagamores, not to listen to our song squaws or you know sachems um that they were evil and everything was bad and the only way to get to to god was through christianity and so it it, it was difficult and and so those are just some of the things that happened and then loss of land and um eventually being pushed to the west of the um northern part of Chappaquiddick called the North Neck. And that became our reservation. And um, the land, the, the soil, it's very sandy. So it was very hard for us to plant. Whereas before we were where the soil was rich. And of course, we grew our crops and people ate. And so things changed. Um, we also had another um, reservation, another area where there was peat moss. Um, which was used for fuel. Um, people were trying to make a living. And my family, we made brooms, we picked berries and um, made soap. And eventually it was hard to um, sell those products. So people started leaving and they left the elders. In their hearts, they said they were going to return. And some people never, um, returned. They ended up going to the main island or Nantucket, New Bedford, Providence, Boston, and beyond just to make a living. And that's how so many of the people in Providence in the community where I grew up, that's where a lot of the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag ended. Um, um, well, not ended their uh, 
uh, in other words, that's where they settled. And they had the desire to go back to the island and, and they just ended up staying in, in Providence, Rhode Island where they could get a job and raise a family, always in their hearts wanting to go back. And so that's what happened to us in a, in a nutshell. Yeah, so can you um, tell us about the different areas about your tribe, like I know you've already mentioned um, some of the history and stuff, but like right now you're located where? Where where are you living? I'm living in uh, Maryland. Oh, <laughs> many of our not. tribal members live in in Providence and in Massachusetts, but there are some of us who live in other areas. So when I was the um, the Sonk um, in '95, I was elected. I was always there. I was going back and forth, flying, train, you know, <laughs> riding, driving, just to be there and um, to uh, conduct business, to have ceremony um, and meetings and stuff. So um, it was, I was always on the road. We, well, I do want to say. Hmm? Go ahead. I, I, I do want to say that um, the Chappaquiddick Wampanoag, we are a historical Massachusetts tribe. And even though we're not federally recognized, there is no real state recognition, so to speak, but there's enough information written about us, um, the census records, you know, the 1849, 1861 is how many of us connect. Um, the records that were kept in New England were quite um, um, lots of things about us, written about us, and census records and deeds and all kinds of things. So um, there was enough for us to understand and to know exactly who we were. It's on paper, but we knew who we were. Um, even <laughs> you didn't have to need the paper to understand that, but. It did help because in New England, um, there's, a, there's a story that I, that I like to tell. I think I was in the fifth grade and um, had a great summer, had gone to uh, the Cape. You know, I was, we, were, we were all over New England. We were on the island of um, Martha's Vineyard um, and I participated in the Green Bean Festival and the Strawberry Festival and we were at August meeting uh, down in Narragansett territory. So when I went to school, the teacher said, boys and girls, tell us what you did this summer. So I wrote what I did and I was very shy. So when it was time for me to read what I did, I stood up and I talked about and I read all the things that I had done that summer. And when I sat down, the teacher came over to me and she firmly put her hand on my shoulder and kind of squeezed my shoulder and said, it's not nice to make up stories like this. You know, all the New England Indians are dead. And that was a shocker. Wow. <laughs> Especially when you had spent the summer visiting your relatives, right? Right. So it made me feel very um, vulnerable because everybody turned around and kind of snickered and, you know, as if I had made everything up. So when I went home, I told my mother what happened. And uh, my mother was a very, um, she had a quiet way about her, but she looked at me and admonished me saying, never let anybody tell you who you are. So the next day she accompanied me to school and we went to the principal's office and my mother got a chance to talk to the teacher. And um, I, I guess to this day, I, I'm always thinking that that teacher got a little history lesson from my mother that day. Oh gosh, I'm so, you know, that I think we all have those fortunate stories where mother had to step in and go and face the school officials for wrongs done by teachers to indigenous children in the schools. And in our case on the Navajo reservation, we didn't get uh, any kind of colonization contact until probably the late 1700s. 
but really um, towards more of the mid 1800s to the late 1800s when the encroachment really started to happen. So, but there's certainly um, lots of juxtapositions in that whole um, uh, patrilineal approach to our matrilineal cultures that we share. So uh, with all of this, I, I've heard from uh, Judy, who's with us tonight. Thank you, Judy uh, Shapiro, you. that is, uh, that you are an amazing artist. Where do you draw your energy and your um, enthusiasm for your art from? Um, so many places. The water is one. I mean, I'm an ocean person and I spent a lot of time in the summer and sometimes in the winter just going to the ocean. Um, uh, an aunt of mine, you know, had a house on Martha's Vineyard and a lot of times, you know, she would just scoop me up and we'd go over to the vineyard in the winter, late fall, winter, so she could check on the house. And I loved it because, you know, you're going over on the, on the ferry and it would be chilly, but it would just be so invigorating. And uh, so I, that's one, place and then woods. I used to spend a lot of time in the woods. Um, I love the woods and I would get inspiration from, you know, just, just being there, smelling the pine. And there's something about, you know, when you're walking through a pine grove and you hear the crunch of the pine needles and um, it's very, it, it's soothing to me. And I, I would always draw trees and just think about you know, just everything, the changes of the season. Now I'm an abstract artist. So a lot of how I interpret um, my art uh, is through <clears throat> sort of in, in impressions and symbols and um, color, lots of color. But then on the other hand, I love uh, line drawing and I love pen and ink. So I like to do these intricate uh, drawings with people and, and maybe profiles and faces kind of joined together in many ways. Um, and just, I don't know, it's just a flow, but it's coming from every, everywhere, you know? Is, it's coming is from that art on the background, some of your artwork? Oh, I, I, actually, no. Um, this piece uh, with the uh, Wampanoag man was, was done by, um, uh, a friend, his name is Hartman Dietz, and he's Mashby Wampanoag. And um, so I have one of his pieces. And um, the the other the other piece is um, another wonderful artist here in the DC area. So um, wonderful. I, my husband and I collect art, and I like to sell my art. <laughs> right, right. Yeah, there you go. Yeah, yeah. yeah that's that's great. Well, I what going off way off into another field with this next question, what will it take for the Wampanoags to get absolute federal and state recognition? Because my goodness gracious, you all are one of the first tribes that I know of that had contact with the Europeans. Uh, yeah what would it take? Can you do a nutshell and explain to us what it would take for that to happen? Why isn't that happening? I mean, that's crazy. It's complicated. It really is. Um, I, one, one thing that happens, happened to me because, you know, as you can see, I'm also African-American. So there were a lot of different things that happened very, very early on. And um, in the state of Massachusetts, as it did in a lot of other places, you know, there was this mentality of erasing um, the people and, and saying that, well, they've intermarried and, you know, they're, they're so far away from the original people, maybe they don't exist anymore, which is why that teacher responded to me the way she did. So um, a lot of that um, still kind of hangs in the, in the air, but we've come, a, a long way in some respects, but there's just um, land issues for us, for Chappaquiddick people. It, it's, it's about the land, it's about um, the people who live on the island who 
weren't always sure why we came back, why we returned, and what does that mean? A lot of people don't have clear title to their land. So, you know, we've, we've talked to the state, we've talked to the governor, we've written letters, and then they keep saying that's in the hands of the town, of Town, you know, for you to try to get land or try to do anything. Now, one good thing that's happening is um, our, our tribe happened to uh, get involved with the wind energy projects that are going on in Massachusetts, Vineyard Wind. And that was one of the first encounters that we had uh, getting involved so deeply, um, sharing our opinions, um, hope, hoping that they would kind of toe the line in a sense and make sure that they, um, they were doing the right kind of research and that they were you know, really understanding how important it is to uh, protect the land. So we found out that the cable was gonna be going pretty close to a very sacred area. And that's what really got us involved. Um, we had hoped for some kind of mitigation, but what ended up happening is they decided our mitigation would be um, $150,000 towards an ethnographic study of our people and the land. So that's a good thing. In, in some respects, it's, it's good. Um, so we're working with some really great um, uh, people. Um, you know, they're hearing our stories and um, we take them to different parts of Chapa Creek that are very sacred and important. Um, they've done a lot of um, archeological surveys. They haven't done a lot of digs there, but they've done some surveys. And basically the whole island is very sensitive, culturally sensitive. Um, there are burial grounds there are, um, that a lot of people don't know about. Uh, they, the, vi the very village that I, I knew it was a village. I, I knew it in my spirit um, because in the 70s, my husband and, and I would always go to the vineyard and stay for a couple of weeks and then go to Chappaquiddick all the time. And I'd always go to an area where I knew um, my family had land. Um, that we hadn't lost, there were just little lots. And so we would go to this particular area and it was kind of hilly and I would stand on that hill and feel the energy of the ancestors. And I would always tell my husband, I said, I know that this was a very special place. So the people who were doing our, the ethnographic study on us had also done an archeological survey and they said, that area, because I had spoken with them, they interviewed me, was very sacred. They found um, uh, fire pits. Um, they found a lot of a lot of things that, which was a major indication that that was a very special village, because it, you know, it was uh, within proximity to uh, water, and um, wooded areas. I mean, it was just. It couldn't have been anything but that. The island is not that big. <laughs> so right. and it had lush soil and um, so many, so many special things about it. And anyway, I <laughs> I'm it, sorry. That's no. you know, that's that really that uh, huh, I have so many questions. I'm gonna have to talk to you and Judy when we're not um, on on <laughs> this on this show because I got a lot of questions. So in terms of you and, and your husband, perhaps, and your background in terms of education, history, and uh, careers, um, what, can you tell us just a little bit about that? Like, um, besides an, being an artist, what else have you done? I know that you've been a, chi a, a tribal leader, stuff like that. Curious. Well, you know, I'm an activist to the bone, <laughs> so I've always um, been involved in, in that. And Art and activism, I think, go hand in hand for a lot of different reasons. Art meaning not only visual, but spoken word, poetry, songs, you know, just everything. Um, <clears throat> but I, I did, um, I've always worked with young people, um, you know, teaching art or doing things like that. I did go to Rhode Island School of Design, the same school that my mother went to. She graduated, I didn't. <laughs> I, I just wanted to be a free spirit. 
and um, I uh, so I've always stayed in in that in that in that area. Um, I just I love art and I love working with young people and I love mentoring and you know just whatever I can do to help uh, young people. Uh, I I'm I'm there to do it. I'm there to do it. That. I mean, that's, that's where it, that's where it's at, because that's our future. You know, I mean, when we're gone, we'll have left little seeds. I, I feel similar to you in that way. Um, so what are you working on right now? I know you're probably I, working on a lot of stuff, but what is like a real main thing for you? Um, I'm really so involved with my tribal community right now. We um, were fortunate to uh, um, apply for two grants and we did get them. Uh, the second grant is, <laughs> these are COVID grants and, and one was a federal grant and the, the latest one is a state grant and it gave us a lot of leeway where we could create different things for our, our tribal community. And one big issue was health. Um, so along with keeping people up to date on what's happening with COVID, we were also able to create programs. So we have, um, a, we call it the Chappaquiddick um, Health and Wellness Program. And so it encompasses a lot of different things. Um, mental health, a lot of people, you know, hunkered down during COVID and a lot of depression, a lot of different things. Uh, you know, went on with, with people. Um, and then there were people who did get COVID and, you know, they were affected by that in many different ways. So we knew that we had to do something and this um, grant has allowed us to do it. So because of Zoom, we were able to uh, invite people to come and, and do presentations. Um, we've had, um, we partnered with the um, Northeastern uh, rematriation uh, collective, and it's all about encouraging women to get back into the soil and plant and and get back to tradition. And so we are like really involved in that. Um, they came to our um, ceremony and cultural event that we had on the island um, during the summer, and they brought you know, seedlings and, and starter plants and um, pass them out to people who wanted them. <clears throat> and so we are all planting in many different ways, indoor plants, um, learning about um, some of our, our medicine ways. Um, uh, we just did a foraging walk last weekend with um, somebody from our sister tribe uh, from the Shinnecock Nation, Shanae Bullock, and she wrote a book, um, 50 Medicine Plants That We Should Know About. And uh, so we partnered with her in the past with different things. And so this is very special um, that she's working with us um, with the knowledge that she has. And it, it, I could go on and on and on. It's just open so many pathways for us and uh, we I'm right in the middle of it you know as an elder and working with a lot of young people who really want to do things and to get involved so we have a great team for our um, both of our grants and um, we're the el the elders who are involved are just listening we're listening amazing so let me ask you now with the, you know, we're right into the Gen Z's now. We yeah. just, we came out of the millennials, whoever was born up to, I think, 86, yeah. 86 and onward, the millennials. From, from your generation, my generation, my mother's generation, and um, our beautiful interpreter's generation, she would be a Gen Z, Mariah. Do you believe that like our grandparents, our great grandparents that were, were were impacted by colonization and language removal, or at least trying to, which thank God it didn't work completely. Um, and you know, forced religion and stuff like that, and the school system, the boarding school era, and that whole kind of subservient training to domesticate everybody 
and take them away from cultural and tradition. People have been impacted by generations. Do you think the now, the young generation now is as impacted as say your grandparents or your parents or even yourself for that matter? Or do you think the, the Wampanoags from your youth group are like knowing a little bit, but not as maybe psychically scarred from it? Or is it, do you believe it's in the DNA and the, uh, how do you feel about that? That trauma, that post-colonial trauma? It's a combination of, of, of many things. Um, uh, where do I begin on that? Um, you know, for I, I have a lot of grandchildren and, and some great grandchildren now, and I, I try to sit down and talk to them. I show them pictures of, of family members and, you know, from way back and they're intrigued, but the attention span is a little, you know, uh, short because of technology. And uh, so I said, okay, I have, I'm going to have to come up with something you know, to, I'll send them pictures and then they can go on their, on their phones or on their tablets and then they can, you know, look at it instead of me with the family album saying, and this is, you know, great, 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 blah, blah, blah. And, it, you know, it's like, oh, okay. And then they're back to their phones. So I'm coming up with different things for, for the 14 and 11 and 14 year olds, but, uh, some of the young people that we're working with, they are so sharp and they see things that maybe I miss and some of the other elders miss. We're, we're, it's kind of catching up and understanding, trying to really understand them and how they think and what they do. They are amazing in terms of technology. Um, we've been able to do some, a lot of stuff because they know exactly what is needed. Uh, you know, they, they, they know all these different formats and programs that we can use. And they'll, they'll say, oh, you should be using, we could use this and then we'd be able to communicate better. And it just goes on and on like that. And a lot of them have great writing skills and um, math skills. Yeah. So we, we're, we're blessed with that. And, and they, they focus in on that. They're in their 20s, their early early 20s and mid 20s. Oh, wow. That is so yeah. cool. That is, <laughs> that, is, that is really hopeful because if, if I was to answer that question, I would probably go more for the negative and, yeah. and, and look at some of the negative impacts. But just listening to you go to the blessings and the beautiful stuff and the talent and the skills and the technology and utilizing all that. I think that's so beautiful because I'm, you know, I, I come from, as you might not know, but I come from a place called Black Mountain and Big Mountain, Zifijin and Zifinsa, and there's still no running water up there and there's still no infrastructure. And some of the home sites do have electrical outlets now, finally, after all these years. And so much has happened and people are still really, really hurt. People are still really, really angry and people are still wanting transparency and not getting it. And um, from that standpoint, it's, it's, it, it's sad and it, it, sadness can easily transpire into anger. And it's yes. so beautiful to see you with your beauty way and blessings and your essence. It's just, you're beautiful. Thank you for joining us tonight. I'm gonna ask you one last question your answer and then we're going to go to a little commercial break and we'll get to hear Elena talking about what's going on with indigenous ways. So what is your definition of thriving and purpose in 2022, Penny? Be open to the universe. Um, understand, <laughs> understand that there, you know, there's the yin and yang, that there's good and then there's not so good in life and that's a balance. Sometimes it seems off balance, but to really find the balance within, and this is something at this age, this stage of my life, I'm, I'm really starting to understand that sometimes you have to, you have to, not sometimes, you have to let go of certain things. You have to understand that some way, somehow, things will come back to center. And um, I, I see that it does happen, not all the time, but 
it, it, it can work. So I'm, I'm really pr putting a lot of prayers out there in terms of what's happening with Mother Earth and how rematriating and doing ceremony and really coming to good terms with, you know, things can be lifted and, and a shift can happen. That's where I'm at right now. That's beautiful. And I've got, I see some questions from gorgeous Andrea. Andrea, we love you. Thank you for being with us. We're going to get to that question for Penny as soon as Elena's commercial break. Thank you, Penny. I'm going to let Elena go into her spiel and then we'll come back with starting with Andrea and then we'll open into Facebook posts and so forth. Thank you. Beautiful. Thank you for that, Tasha. And thank you so much, Elder Penny Gamble Williams. Uh, just absolutely uh, powerful, beautiful. Thank you for uh, educating me, uh, particularly being a Chappaquiddick tribe of the Wampanoag Nation. Uh, just such an honor uh, to have you. So thank you. You know, we're just going to go into a slight commercial break and then we're going to invite everyone to come in. Or if you're feeling a bit shy or you're on social media, please put any comments that you may have or questions that you may have for Elder Penny. Uh, this is that wonderful time of uh, what we have been up to. <laughs> so last Wednesday, the 21st of September, we had our fifth and final monthly seasonal Indigenous Ways Festival here in Santa Fe, where we are based at the Santa Fe Rail Yard Park and uh, had wonderful entertainment. It's for families, so there were kids activities. We had food vendors, artisans, uh, activities going on as well as entertainment dances. So it was just a wonderful evening. Joel Zoll and also Mariah, our beautiful interpreters here, uh, they were one of the team of four ASL interpreters that we had. Uh, but it was a very, very powerful uh, time and evening of having the community out, out uh, and supporting our Native American, Indigenous, LGBTQIA2S+, and deaf and hard of hearing community. So the diversity was just gorgeous. Because isn't that the indigenous way, our tribal things that we do. And uh, if you weren't able to join us physically, we were also having uh, this beamed out live. Um, so for those of you, and I'll put this in the chat box as well, not only here in Zoom, but also other chat boxes in uh, that we have going in our social media. Uh, but if you attended physically or in person, we'd love you to do the survey. And it's giving us feedback of how we can do better, uh, perhaps partners with other organizations, businesses, uh, and also suggested artists. So this is a project that we are co-creating with you. And if you came and join us online, we really want to hear your feedback. We had thundering and lightning, I think it was last month, so we wouldn't get barbecued, we had to cut everything. Uh, but uh, giving feedback uh, is really valuable for us, so how we can better this. Uh, so also uh, what's been happening is our our what's happening next month so now we're back on the third month the third wednesday of each month we've got the indigenous ways wisdom circle we have got the beautiful masawa who has three places around turtle island right now her and her partner eagle are back here out in uh, New Mexico on our woman's land. So welcome back. Anyway, Musawa will be joining us. She is also uh, for the last 42, nearly 45, let's round that up because it sounds so good. Last 45 years has been putting the Wee Moon calendar together. She's been very instrumental uh, on, about woman's land. Uh, so she will be joining us. So we'd love to see you October the 19th, same time, same place, same channel. Uh, and you can go to our website, indigenousways.org, and find out more about uh, Musawa. And also in a couple of weeks, 
Uh, if you want to share this wonderful recording with Alda Penny, uh, you can. Uh, you can also go to our newsletter, uh, find out all these amazing things that have been happening in the in the community or that are happening. We'd love to see you. If you're on social media, please like or subscribe to the many, many pages that we have. We really want to hear from you. Um, and this Wisdom Circle has been very blessed to support over 175 presenters who are now in our archive library where Alda Penny will be. And again, that's at indigenousways.org. Uh, on the website there, you'll see video archives. So um, what else is going on is uh, all of these virtual events, which we started April 2020, have been free. They have ASL interpreters making access available to all. We want to thank our sponsors, the National Endowment of the Arts, the City of Santa Fe Arts and Culture Department, the New Mexico Humanities, the National Endowment of Humanities and making this possible. Also all our individual donors uh, where we can keep doing these series and really pay our presenters what they are worth. Um, you can also, uh, also our board members, some of them are on, thank you Homer, Missy, and also Judy Shapiro who is here, who also said, hey, you need to have Penny Gambles Williams on. Uh, so thank you for that great thank suggestion. Thank you, Judy. Uh, we also, if you are able to donate, we have PayPal, Venmo. We've also got on our website uh, at the donate, where you can send that if you want to keep supporting us in this beautiful habit of supporting all our amazing presenters through here. And also uh, we have Snail Mail, which is PO Box 4073, Santa Fe, New Mexico, 87502. So we'd love to, uh, we'd love to uh, see you there. Now in saying that, you can see this amazing Penny Gamble Williams .com. You can go to a website. Uh, there you can see this extraordinary uh, archive of work that she has done. Uh, so please be sure to check that out. And now what's going to happen? We've just, if you want the opportunity uh, to come on, uh, now's the time to uh, start your videos up. If you want to say a few words or just say hi to the beautiful Alda Penny. Uh, we've also got uh, some conversations going on in the chat uh, box. And I must say uh, to the beautiful um, uh, Nicole Oxendine, who made a comment earlier as you were making comments, Penny. And I'm sorry, uh, Nicole, but I can't seem to get hold of your um video uh, your uh, message so if you can pop that on that'll be fabulous and with that Taj I'm going to go to you All right. unmute there. okay everybody um this is Aroha A-R-O-H-A -A. she's from the Navajo reservation and she wants to say hello I'm growing up in Santa Fe hi everybody I'm the latest addition to the home so she's getting really healthy. She's putting on weight. As you can see, she's more than a pound. So I'll let you go now, Otto, huh? Bye-bye. So that's our latest addition to our home. Let's, uh, let's get started to honor our beautiful questions here. Um, watch you, okay, who's, uh, hello, it's great to be here. Hey, Narissa, it's great for, to see you. I wanna say hi to you. Okay, Andrea Otero saying, I'm so sorry for that stupid teacher. Gracias to mama and all mamas. How big is Chappaquiddick compared to MV or Nantucket? Nantucket is very small, I believe, near nine square miles or so. Thank you, ASL persons. Chappaquiddick is approximately um, six miles long and eight miles wide, give or take. There's there's um, erosion going on and 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 different things like that, but it's not very big at all. 
All right, thank you very much. And on to our beautiful visitor that's come in all the way from the traditional lands of Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, Delaware, and Huda nations of Turtle Island in an area people now call uh, Southwestern Ontario, Canada. Uh, question uh, is, uh, did you wanna ask our beautiful elder Penny a question, Kaliuti? Sugoli, uh, Swagwag, Galahindi New Gats, Wagisli, Wagini, Wakataloda, Onida Agungwe, Wanege, Oni Bojo, Dante, Okinapi. I always introduce myself in my original language before I speak so that people know who I am and where I am from. So I said, my name is Galahindi. It translates to clouds passing over in the colonial language. Um, I'm a member of the people of the Standing Stone First Nations of the Thames uh, here on the traditional lands, uh, as mentioned, of the Haudenosaunee, Delaware, Huron, and Anishinaab nations on, um, in the area that's been segregated and relabeled Canada. And uh, within the confines of that territory, I'm in an area now called Southwestern Ontario. So, Penny, I was curious. I always I think these events are great. And I think that we have to continue to tell our stories and we have to continue to educate people because our, I think for the most part, a great large majority of the um, community don't actually know our true history or what's going on with our people. And so they don't really understand what they're seeing and hearing in the news oftentimes. And so when we think of the history of colonialism, it's still continuing today. So I wonder what you think when um, things like the militant uh, representatives of our colonial government here on in the northern part of uh, Turtle Island are, are sending their uh, RCMP to invade sovereign nations and territories like the Wet'suwet'en and forcing them, uh, they're pulling them from their reserve, oftentimes violently, arresting them um, on kind of, I guess, jokes of, 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 of charges. Um, what can we do or what should we be doing to um, to put an end to that and actually create true reconciliation? Because um, here in Canada, um, I mean, September 30th, we actually have Truth and Reconciliation Day. So this is a day it's intended to uh, honor the students of residential schools in Canada and boarding schools in the U.S. Um, and uh, both the ones who survived and the ones that didn't, because we know that thousands of them didn't survive. Um, but I think it it could be expanded and in, in, in more inclusive to other aspects of our cultures that, that we need to address as well. And I was just wondering where your stance is on that. Hmm. Yonko. Um... My goodness, thank you for that. Um, there's so much to say about what's going on. And yes, colonialism definitely exists to this day. Um, so many of us have that psychic trauma and many, I'll speak for myself, finding, finding ways to address and to, uh, to address these issues and to, stay healthy <laughs> you know i mean there's there's just so much and i um i made um a promise to myself that i was going to find ways to uplift to raise the vibration and the energy when i speak um and to uh, find find ways to um mitigate some of these things and that's why i mentor young people because they know that things are not right. And, and when they do um, learn about the history, um, there is a sadness and, and there's something that, that happens and, and a lot of people act out in different ways. And I understand that. Um, so you do the best you can, but we have to be honest with what's going on. And uh, <laughs> because in a way it's surreal, right? I mean, there were just, it's so against our ways of being, how how we understand what this earth means to us. It's it, everything is upside down. 
And I talk to young people about this. And sometimes you have to be frank and then we have to have discussions about it. And I like to listen and find out how they feel about it. And what would they do? What can we do? You know, this, it, it has to be intergenerational. We have to learn how to listen uh, to each other. I don't have all the answers. And a lot of young people, like I said, some of the young people we're working with, they, they try and find answers because they wanna see a future. <laughs> and um, and they're, they're going through a lot of changes. Right now, I think what's helping our youth, the ones that are involved, is they, they see that this is a chance to really do something. You know, our, our mission is to go back to the land, to get our land back. You know, land back, I mean, there's a lot of talk about land back. This, is, this has been going on for like over 500 years. So it's nothing new. <laughs> so we have to find ways to make that happen and, and understand that we're, you know, always again, up against the wall with, with uh, some of the laws and some of the ways um, that, you know, uh, the government operates. And so we have to, we have to figure that we have to figure it out and then make it happen. Um, colonialism is alive and well. Thank you very much for that. Uh, I know we're almost out of time, everyone, and I want to hear from everyone. So really quickly, I want to definitely have to say, hear something from Judy Shapiro. Judy, would you like to say, Hey, Hey, so Penny and I live what, five miles apart. Yeah. Um, we never see each other. We have to fix that. Yep. Maybe, maybe I should scoop you up and we'll go to the ocean. There you go. I think that's what we need to do. Um, the, the short answer, sort of tying in a number of people's comments on recognition, because I've spent, I guess, 30 years of my life on this, on this process, is that federal acknowledgement is, is a perpetuation of colonization. That's all it is. It is talking to the people who are exerting control and saying, please, please, can you stop oppressing us at least this one small way? Can you let us prove to you that you've been oppressing us? Can you let us prove to you that we still here despite all your oppression? And after the end of all of that, could you please you know, put a little seal on it saying that we actually managed to survive in ways that you deem important rather than what we deem important? And by the way, is it okay if we document it at least one bit of information for every decade? that used to be since the beginning of white contact, which in the East Coast was a long, long time. And now we can we only have to go back to 1890. Hot shit. Um, as long as you also prove you're a historic tribe, which means going back to European contact also. So the reason why it's not done or it's not done already or that it still has to be done is one of the great bureaucratic artifacts of colonization. Here's my answer. Well, you know what, Judy, I would love for you to come work with us on Black Mountain. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's great. Okay, well, um, we got less than a minute to go, but Narissa, would you like to say hey? I would. Thank you. That was such an incredible presentation, and um, I wish you the best of luck um, with getting that recognition. I think it will happen. Um, I don't know how it'll happen, but I believe it will happen. I do. Um, I really would like to see some of your art. I would like to, um, I would love to see some of your art. I love abstract art. And um, maybe uh, Tosh and Elena can share some of your information with me uh, later, yes. but I would really love to see your, um, love to see your work. But thank you so much for that presentation. Oh, thank and you. Uh, keep, keep doing everything that you're doing. Um, and spreading that light in the world. Uh, thank you so much. Thank you. And, and while, you're you, it, so Pen, while you're at it, Pen, you. while you're at it, Penny, check out Zalima Harris. That's her mom. Yes. She's a PhD that's the, mm -hmm. a mate. Where is your, okay, we got to go, you guys. I'm going to pass it over to Elena, but check out Zalima Harris. I will. I'll, te yeah. I'll text information and, and also right. narissa bond to herself who is an accomplished musician it's great to see Un unbelievable narissa. musician yeah. unbelievable so just honoring Thank everyone you. is there anyone else who wanted to share something or a comment or anything like that with elder penny may i say one little thing <laughs> absolutely please 
Some of our young people do not want federal recognition. Hmm. It's really interesting. Um, they've been doing their own research and they feel like we could do things, be innovative, uh, start businesses, and uh, they've already started doing their research. So, um, you know, we'll, we'll see what happens, but that's, that's not on the top of their list. And they're the future leaders right now, which is why we're working with them. So um, we'll see what happens. That's exciting. Keep us Definitely posted. Definitely another conversation and, there. Um, Rusawa, I'm going to go to you. Rusawa will be our guest presenter on October the 19th. It's wonderful to see you and welcome back to New Mexico. Yay, Rusawa's back. Yes, hi. <laughs> Penny, I just wanted to say we would love to see some of your art in Wee Moon. It's art and writing from women all over the world, and we really want more Indigenous women's art and women of color art. And, you know, there's a lot of ways to get recognition, and one is the cultural sharing that that um, that Tosh and Elena are doing such a great job of in this. And, and the Wee Moon is just, it's a, it's a calendar, uh, a, a date book, a women's date book and um i'd love to see some of your edit the and also for some of the um, other participants in this www.wemoon.ws is a way to just find out who who we are and what it's about and how to submit work and stuff oh well, i thank have you one of those <laughs> what great i i think i have a book is oh it, great is it, yeah it's, it's called we moon gaia rhythms for women the date book yeah, yeah. Yes. Not oh. great. So thank you for that, Musawa. Yeah. And thank Musawa's you. Musawa is a legend. And a legend. Yeah. And if <laughs> you want to hear well. more about we we moon, we moon calendars. Uh, as I said, October the nineteenth, Musawa will be here sharing that. Um, right. Musawa and Penny, if you want to connect through the chat box, we'll connect you uh, via email as well. But we want to take this moment to thank everyone who's watching live, whether that be in the Zoomsters or over on social media. If you're watching the future of tomorrow, thank you for blessing us and finding out all about this wisdom. We also want to thank our incredible interpreters tonight. We've got Mariah Garcia, who is interpreting. And before that, we had the beautiful Zoe Yaba. And also, you know, Musa will be joining us next week, 93rd Wednesday of each month, same time, same channel. We'd love to see you bring some friends. We want to thank each and every one of you for blessing us. But more importantly, please, let's give it up for the one and only Peggy Campbell. Touch the earth.